I'm Andrew Maxwell, a comedian. But in this series, I'm on a serious mission to explore the world of the conspiracy theorist. Tonight, I'm in America with five Brits who all believe they've had encounters of the alien kind. Hi there. Hello. Bridget. All right. Hello, Bridget. They claim to have witnessed spacecraft from other galaxies. Darren. Hello, nice. Darren. Been attacked by UFOs. Hello, Andrew. I'm Scott. Had close encounters with ETs. How ben? are you, man? Yeah, hey, Ben, great. welcome on board, man. Oh, what's your yeah, name? Do it. Frankie. Frankie, welcome on board, Frankie. <laughs> and even believe an alien invasion is imminent. Most scientists think we are not alone in the universe. But like myself, they are skeptical about claims of alien visitation and government cover-ups. I'm taking my five companions on a USA road trip to explore some iconic UFO hotspots and meet experts who will help me refute their extraterrestrial claims. It's just unidentified. Yeah. Okay, don't go any further than that. There will be upsets. Don't, cos now you will get me crying now that I'm here. But lots of fun. And outlandish behaviour. How do I survive and then how do I defend if the aliens do kind of, you know, take the streets? Fasten your seatbelts and welcome to Conspiracy Road Trip UFO. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Andrew. I will be your tour guide on this journey. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Conspiracy Road Trip UFOs. Yay! It's day one and we're in L.A. Over the next few weeks, each of my fellow travellers is going to offer up a claim which I'll try and disprove. First up is Bridget. Will you please welcome Bridget? Give her a round of applause. Yay! Involved a 45-foot craft over the freeway at 10 6 at night. Um, myself and somebody else was there, and I hope you get the pleasure to experience it yourselves. Bridget had her most memorable alien encounter while she was working in LA 19 years ago. What you're going to see is a reconstruction. This is me in the car, my friend superimposed the holiday in and made the spaceship. And that's, uh, to your mind's eye, that's, is that a... Is exactly what I saw. On a regular day in LA. There's the holiday in. OK. Yes, it's over there. Incredibly, Bridget's sighting was at this busy freeway intersection. Where were you? In the car. All of a sudden, I had this silver, hard, solid object, which was 45 foot in length, so from here to over to, over to there. Size of the road, basically. Size of the road. It is gliding over the back boot of the car in front of me. It's then going over here, ploughing through the tops of the trees. Got my hands prized to the steering wheel. Eyes were just watering. Body felt physically sick. It's like, what the hell is this thing? Has there any be, ever been doubts in your mind? I saw it. I was underneath this object. Even some of the other trippers are sceptical of Bridget's account. I have my suspicions. Um, I, I'm not a 100% believer. It's a bit outlandish, especially on such a public place like this. Why haven't more people kind of seen it? Whilst I'm not discrediting it, I just would have assumed that there would have been uh, kind of more witnesses. I mean, to my mind, I, like a craft the size of the road, it would have been me. But you know what? What if everyone else was transfixed the way that I was? Bridget, single mother of three, is from Devon. She had her first extraterrestrial encounter when she was seven. Can't explain why they came to me, and they keep coming back to me, but I like the fact that they do. Day two, with dissent and disbelief still in the air, it's time for some objective science. 
We're heading out to Mount Wilson Observatory. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. In lieu of Bridget's testimony earlier of having seen all sorts of carry on, we are going to meet a man by the name of Seth Shostak. Yay! Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Dr. Seth Shostak is a world-renowned astronomer. He works for the SETI Institute, a scientific organization whose mission is to search the cosmos for signs of extraterrestrial intelligence. What we try and do is try and eavesdrop on signals that they might be sending our way. Okay. So just trying to just trying to hear ET's radio broadcasts. Now, I'm sure there are a lot of planets out there that have plenty of life that's not very clever. Life that doesn't write great literature and doesn't build radio transmitters. But we're not going to hear from those guys. No. Our galaxy has 200 billion stars. It probably has a trillion planets. That's with a T. Right. That's a large number. Now, if this is the only planet where anything interesting is happening, that makes us a miracle. Right. And one thing you learn from studying astronomy is that every time you believe in miracles, you're wrong. Like many scientists, Dr. Shostak thinks that alien life exists, but we just haven't seen it yet. So what does he think of Bridget's UFO encounter? I had a close encounter in central Los Angeles, Brentwood, and it involved 45-foot craft. But no pictures? I was in shock. I think you would be also. <laughs> you know, if I had a camera, I would still have someone ridicule me. Can I ask, what about the craft made you think it was extraterrestrial? It was nothing that I had seen before. It had no wings, it had no fuel. Well, you say that, but you would have <clears> seen something <throat> like that in the movie. Yeah, I've seen spaceships on TV. It's, it's all children's, children's TV channels. Now, are spaceships everywhere. I think that if there were compelling evidence, yes, you would have tens of thousands of academics beavering away, working on that. If the evidence is poor, they're not going to waste their time. That's the thing. And the fact that they're not doing that means that the evidence is poor. There's not a very good case for alien visitation. Dr. Shostak's views make complete sense to me. But Darren thinks something's not quite right. There are parts of space that the Hubble telescope will not point at. And that's said to be under direction from NASA and the military or the government. For me, I think if there was a large object, I don't think they would publicly announce that straight away. And but tell who would the, the they be? Away. You'd be kind of the they, would you not? Well, we'd be so among the they, but there'd be about 10,000 astronomers who are part of the they. <laughs> and the idea that they're all in some conspiracy is kind of goofy. There's no conspiracy to keep things secret in science. I picked up on his body language, and his body language, his eyes flicked, and they kept flicking and flicking and flicking. And if you read body language, that's a sign that you might not quite be telling us all the true facts. It's not something I spotted. I wanted to ask the doctor, why do ordinary people like Bridget and Darren believe they've seen such extraordinary things? There's something about a conspiracy that I think is very empowering. If, if you, for example, think that we're being buzzed by alien spacecraft, uh -huh. and those pointy-headed, nerdy scientists down at the local university don't agree with you, you know something they don't know. Yes. And so there's something empowering it's about that. It's a cachet. That. Yeah, I, I think that that's understandable. It's time for dinner and a chance to find out what the trippers make of their close encounter with Dr. Shostak. We're not scientists, we're just researchers, you know? And it would be great for him, like from my point of view, I think, if he could just open his mind a little bit more. To use the term open-minded, you, you're ultimately you're saying people are closed-minded if they don't agree with you, mate. Well, that sounds like well, agree with me. For you to believe that they're not being publicly broadcast, you must buy into a conspiracy that the they Government, NASA, are holding information well, back right. from you. They are wide, yeah, they are. I do. For why? Would they Once someone from a, let's say, a more advanced civilization from another planet comes here and shows their face, we lose all power. Everybody, us, the government, everyone. They could control everything. If they have the ability, let's but say, to travel here. If they're here, visiting here, then they already control us, ipso facto. You know what? I you know? think they're really, well, maybe, really clever. Maybe they do. <laughs> if these are real, you can see them, you can touch them. They come in here, they're visiting us. Day three, 
And as we leave California and head towards Arizona, it's time to turn my attention to the youngest of the group. Will you please welcome up to the microphone, your friend, my friend, Ben! 25-year-old Ben lives in Durham and works as a barman. Two years ago, Ben and his girlfriend saw something strange out of their bedroom window. And this kind of uh, orb appeared, and this orb just exploded silently. And these kind of five or six white objects just disappeared across the night sky, literally faster than you've ever seen anything travel in your entire life. After his UFO experience, Ben found faith in a creation theory linking humans with extraterrestrials. Every kind of like uh, society around the world, uh, ancient ones especially, have kind of had a belief in, in gods. Who's to say that these guys weren't like living, breathing, flesh and blood kind of ETs from another planet? We could have been created in their image. Who's to say that God wasn't a living, kind of breathing extraterrestrial? We're heading to Flagstaff, Arizona. I believe yourself, Ben, have put forward the idea that us humans are in some way descendants or possibly related to aliens. That's yes. true. So we're on the way to meet a man by the name of P.Z. Myers. P.Z. Myers is a leading evolutionary biologist. He doesn't rule out the possibility of extraterrestrial life. What, what, what are we talking what about What do you look like? Yes. Okay, well, is, is there any way don't me to talk. Let's try. Don't me to He just thinks your average alien wouldn't look like us. Is it, is it so far-fetched that something could be varied in that yes, manner? Yes, the remarkable thing about the, the stereotypical alien is how much they look like us, how much they look like an infantilized human being. It's not likely, though, that an alien would have exactly this arrangement of features. Why couldn't the wheel be spun in the evolution of our planet and other planets and not make this? Because a lot of these features are contingent. They're historical accidents. Many of the features of, of our face are derived from fish. And what we basically have is modifi modified fish faces. For evolution to produce this creature, from a completely independent lineage on a completely different planet with a completely different history is ridiculously improbable. Yeah. So you could have intelligent aliens on other worlds, but why would you expect the eyeballs right here? Why not put them somewhere else, down here? Nostrils on the I do, top. I do see where you're coming from yeah, with so that point. Yeah, I do, I do see where you're coming from. Right, Ben seems to have been swayed by PZ's argument. Time to get back on the bus. We're heading down Route 375, known locally as the Extraterrestrial Highway, due to the large number of UFO sightings. And where there's sightings, there is always souvenirs. Do you not feel like uh, all this merchandise and stuff is kind of taking the piss out of your opinions? It doesn't matter if you believe or not, these guys have got to make a living and, you know, fair play to them. Is, is this the sort of thing? Um, yeah, pretty much. This is a, a, f a fair enough representation? Um, kind of. But, yeah, kind of. Very muscular, uh, big eyes, almond eyes. Quite scary, though. And similar to lots of people's accounts, eyewitness accounts, yeah. Bridget feels this cardboard cutout is close to what aliens really look like. To me, it's straight out of the movies. But what do the others think? Scotty, is this the sort of fella, is it? <laughs> no, no. That's that's just the way that Hollywood would portray them. No? Yeah, no. Well, no. he just looks, he looks pretty buff. He does his, he's got a good abdominal area, so he does his sit-ups. I mean, just look at the biceps, though, you know. He needs to do a few more reps with a lot more weight. He wouldn't have a, ch he wouldn't have a chance against you. No, even with a force foot, I'd break through it, no problem at all, yeah. Honestly, Scott is not joking. It seems they all have their own personal version of the alien. We're taking a detour to Las Vegas. So far, I've questioned Bridget on her UFO vision and Ben 
about his theories of the origin of man. Bing bong! Heidi hi, campers! Hi, hi! Will you please welcome to the front of the bus our fellow road tripper, Scott! Yay! I'm now turning my attention to Scott, who claims he was attacked by aliens in his own home. My experiences were kind of odd to begin with. It begins with a mind attack. They're trying to break me down through my brain to then take me on physically. Sometime when I woke up, I would see figures coming towards me. So when these aliens were getting closer and closer, it was just at the last second I was able to break free and foil the attempt of these abductions. I had no weapons. I was only in my pants, so I thought if I am up against a seven-foot beefcake, I've only got my underwear. <laughs> 32-year-old telecom technician Scott lives in Swindon and is married with two kids. Since the attack, he's been preparing for the alien invasion of planet Earth. I've been preparing um, for about a year at least. I've been researching what I would need. I've got a lot of advice from people in America that have been hit by um, like tsunamis and, uh, and hurricanes, just to see how they were preparing. Another box I have, uh, salmon and uh, tuna. I've already made uh, meals as well. Uh, I've got an axe, um, not only um, for self-defense, um, but I also use it, um, or I would use it for chopping down trees, uh, firewood. Scott's main fear is alien mind control. I'm going to be uh, making another hat that I would wear um, just to protect my brain from a number of things. But I'm going to get my wife to help me get it on so it's just the right size, it fits right. He's come up with a simple force shield that anyone can make at home. Hold the front on. But the problem will be is well, how they influence Obviously, the way you think, put you into trances, um, make you do things that you don't want to do. People just, you know, people would, would ridicule it. You know, the, the mainstream media have brainwashed people. You know, you're considered crazy if you believe in a conspiracy. You're just labelled the tinfoil hat brigade. When I go out in public, just not to alarm people, cover it up. Scott is dead set serious about all of this. He's picking up the last vital supplies for the battle ahead. <laughs> Scott wants to take advantage of America's relaxed gun laws to try out the kind of weaponry he believes could thwart the alien attack. What, 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 what am I going to do when the aliens get here? I have a machine gun, okay. Okay, and a, um, a handgun. Okay, it's not too heavy. Give me a nine millimeter Glock. Great. Okay. It sounds right. like you're at spec savers. Not too heavy, please. Maybe a pump action shotgun. Nervous. You better not be nervous. When the aliens come there. Like you gotta go straight for it, man. Put the red dot where you want the bullets to go. Squeeze the trigger. How'd you feel? It's kind of a, a shock, the force of the weapon, the power, the, uh, the volume. In your house? The one of them in your house? Not one of them, no. You feel this uh, gun would protect you from an alien invasion? I think they might have a, a force field. Yeah, all right. This whole gun thing ain't for me. And I'm worried arming Scott is only taking this thing in a totally wrong direction. Yeah. That's like the main kind of e entry wound, if you like. Right. And, um, and how would you feel, Space Warrior? It was actually really good fun. Seriously, I know you had fun. I know that both of you wanted to do with that. Yeah, I, yeah. I find guns chilling and unpleasant. Well, I'd rather live in a world without guns. You know, right. No, we have, you know, people, you is know, there a way that you could live in a world without thinking shit is aliens? Yeah? Think there's so much attention on it, we're saturated by it. Could you not just concentrate on something else? Because genuinely, my worry is, I like you, but the idea of, of you arming and training to defend your family in your house 
fills me with sadness beyond compare. We find ourselves in Sedona, Arizona, deep in the American Wild West. Will you please help me welcome to the front of the bus our fellow traveling companion, Darren. 33-year-old Darren is a hard-boiled UFO investigator. His detective work has led him into very dangerous territory. I've now become a well-known UFO investigative researcher in the UK. I investigate crop circles, animal mutilations, abductions, and everything connected to the subject. Darren lives in Shrewsbury and runs a UFO group. In the past two years, he has gathered details on dozens of cases of mutilated farm animals in his local area. This is six hours since the animal was last running around the field, jumping up and playing with its friends. Some animal mutilation cases um, are believed to be linked jointly with uh, alien and military involvement where the military work with the aliens in whatever craft they use, and then there's some sort of lab or bio, biotech place in the country. Darren believes his investigations have disturbed a secret alien world, making him a target. Last year on a sky watch, I got targeted, is the word I'm going to use, by an unknown laser beam in clear sky, which shot down to the ground and right next to me with a crack. And it felt like I'd been electrocuted. I felt sick, I felt nauseous, and it was witnessed by three other people. It, is it a weapon, Darren? Is, is it a weapon, do you think? C could it, if it hit you, would you have perished? I didn't get hit by it. If, if I got hit by it, maybe I'd have been all right. Or so maybe how bad was the damage? I'd on have one ground? eyebrow missing yeah. or one ear missing, you know? But If that shot was a warning to say, look, we're here, stop looking at us, why are you still looking? It's not going to stop me from what I'm doing. It's not going to put me off. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to get to the bottom of, of, of whatever it is. So far, I've had limited success with my trippers. So I'm going to try a little bit of reverse psychology. We're picking up a seasoned UFO investigator, Chris O'Brien. O'Brien's ideas on animal mutilations are so outlandish. How are you doing there, Chris? All right. Hey. I'm hoping they'll make Darren take another look at his own theories. The first thing I do when I go to a case is I look, I look for cut hair follicles. That, to me, is an indication that some sharp implement normally, and on rare occasions, a lazing instrument, has actually made these horrific looking cuts. You want to go up to the top of the hill and then uh, go make a left. Chris has brought us to the kind of farmland where these alien attacks apparently happen. My theory on this is that there's some health organization that's secret that may be attached to the UN or some, you know, sort of international body that is sampling livestock in specific geographic regions. The actual organs that are excised and removed are the places where humans develop cancer most often. Yeah. Check that out. A bizarre UN plan to come up with a cure for cancer? Really? Darren, what do you think of this? What, are, what I believe do you think these animal mutilations are? There's some sort of private or military involvement where, where they're testing what, what's going in the food chain. Do you think it's alien activity? Yeah, quite. 99.9%, .9 I'm sure, that there's, there's an extraterrestrial presence. I think we personally think we're dealing with an ancient predatory presence that's as terrestrial as we are, it's just hidden to us. It's either dimensional, it's either some sort of uh, time-based thing. It could be high-tech chefs coming back to, to, to get, you know, million-dollar uh, plate dinner material through time. Possibly the UN, possibly aliens, possibly a yeah. multi... Uh, dimensional ancient uh, predator. The World yes. Health Organization. And possibly yep. a time-travelling chef. My plan has backfired. 
Chris O'Brien's got Darren reeling with new and even wilder scenarios. If it gets reported through the veterinary channels, where it goes to the authorities, something called a D notice is placed on the press, on the media, yep. and unless unless you're local or you know the farmer or you know investigators, you never know. nobody knows about these cases. Right. The lid is shut tight. So too, it seems, is Darren's mind. The idea of time traveling extraterrestrial chefs in search of a good steak dinner is not for me. There is now only one member of the group whose conspiracy I haven't yet tackled, Frankie. She's not prepared to reveal it on front of the others, but nine years ago, Frankie had a mind-bending experience. I was in my kitchen, washing up, listening to a bit of Kylie, when suddenly, it was like the back of my spine lit up like... Okay. <laughs> like hairs on your neck? No. No? Like, it, it was like my spine itself lit up with energy and this back part of my brain that I'd never used before, like, switched on. And I had um, a full-on vision of the inside of this spaceship city. That's what I saw. And it was, like, the most magnificent, wonderful thing I'd ever seen. Sincerely, we're on the road, you know, I'm not taking a piss, but I, I, I feel duty-bound to ask, where you hide? No. Frankie Ma is a full-time mum and lives in London. Her vision has left her confused. Could they be from another dimension rather than from another planet? She's also quite embarrassed. Admitting, you know, these anomalous experiences, it's essentially like admitting you have herpes. I'm hoping my next expert, psychologist Dr. Michael Shermer, can convince Frankie the alien city is all in her head. He's the publisher of the Skeptic magazine. Oh, Frankie is in no mood for this expert. Michael is well known in UFO circles, and he's not exactly popular. We investigate uh, all kinds of pseudoscientific baloney, would be the nice word. We have yet to even meet Dr. Shermer, and Frankie's already on edge. Now we're going to have to listen to one more person's fucking bullshit. I say bring him on. That's not exactly the spirit of scientific inquiry I was expecting from you, but perhaps that's how you agnostics roll. He's a two-bit hustler. I'll listen to what he has to say for about 4.5 minutes, and then we're off. If you don't have the patience uh, to meet this man, and you've already decided uh, that he's a two-bit hustler. You're apparently the uh, open-minded agnostic, but you're telling me before you've even met the guy that he's a two-bit hustler. I said I would give him, because he opinion. is, and I said I would give him five minutes. Actually, as an open-minded agnostic, I think I'm the one that actually knows more about him than anyone else here, right. because I've researched him. That is my opinion of him. I'm willing to give him five minutes. Five minutes? Five minutes, yeah. That's how long it takes for your inquiring mind to make a decision. I've five given minutes. him far more than five minutes. I've researched him for hours. If you want me to get off the bus, I'll get off the bus. No, I want you to sit down and be patient and get involved in it. I just find, like, it's bullshit, man. Experience. Yes. experience. Everybody ready? Yes. OK. So ready. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on the bus, Dr. Michael Sherber. Hello, Michael. Welcome, Hello. Michael. Hello. Hi, guys. So some of us in the group have had like, literally visions. We've, we've seen things. Uh, I saw a red glowing orb that was, like, pulse, oh. pulsating like that. And then the, as the sight went, sighting went on, I saw two objects, like, white arrowheads fly over uh, from one side of the horizon to the other. Oh, OK. And then the same again with five objects. <laughs> what do you think it was? I think, I believe it was a UFO. But why, why would you think that? Flying object. What do you mean by UFO? It's an unidentified flying object. Yes. Yeah. Okay, but that's all we can say. It's just unidentified. Yeah. Okay, don't go any further than that. It's just unidentified. Yeah. End of story. Until we can figure out what it is, we don't know. 
these are called anomalous psychological experiences. They come in a variety of flavors. Um, one can be triggered by sleep deprivation, fatigue. Uh, sometimes under certain conditions you uh, sense the presence of another person or being or creature. Climbers that do K2 and Everest, they will often have a shared hallucination of another climber with them on the rope who isn't actually there. And, and later they'll talk about it. It's like, did you see that? Yeah, yeah, I saw it. And this is called the sense presence effect. I do kind of wonder, are you being paid to be here today or are you, have you just come along because you're promoting your magazine, etc.? Here's our general position on UFOs. Um, so there's a body of you and you have one general position? No, 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 no. There's no such thing, of course. But uh, I'm just speaking in general, the, the sense of people I know that work in this business. So there's two questions. Are there aliens out there? Have they come here? Yeah. Most of us scientists tend to think that there's probably extraterrestrial life teeming throughout the galaxy, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, get that. At least bacterial grade, maybe even intelligent life, uh, right? Now, the chances of going from, say, something like a Neanderthal, which is a pretty advanced, big brain creature making tools, to actually achieving space flight or radio communication that we can make contact with, that's a, a much harder step to make. I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but I totally disagree because it's been my personal experience, you know, and lots of other factors are involved in that. Unfortunately, our idea of that we're rational beings that can correctly perceive the world around us, it turns out to not to be the case. We are very irrational, emotional, and we misperceive things all the time. From a scientist's perspective, mm -hmm. it's, we, we, it's okay to just say, I don't know, mm -hmm. and let's just let it sit there. But that's what I've always we said. Don't have to, perfect. Yeah, we yeah. don't have to construct a whole worldview of aliens yeah, coming yeah. here yeah. and conspiracies yeah. and men in black and cover up and government. This, that. You don't have to do that. You can just let it sit as like, wow, that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And then just, that's it. I really like was not looking forward to meeting you today, but now that I have, I you're think you're give them really five quite minutes, cool. Frank. Yeah, I was going to give you five, five minutes, minutes, and they go stomping like off to the bar. Forty-five. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. That's our job. Thank you, dude. All right. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. See you. Wave off the skeptic. Bye -bye. Bye. Cheers. I'm more than halfway through my thousand-mile trip. I've had only limited success taking on my tripper's personal theories. So now it's time to tackle the mother of all UFO conspiracies. It centers around Area 51, a top secret military base located deep in the Nevada desert. It's a weapons testing facility. But my lot also believe aliens are being held there. Brought from the infamous 1947 flying saucer crash at Roswell. Hello, fellow road trippers. Hello. Now, we've all heard of Area 51. Yes. Right? It's kind of a key piece in the whole UFOlogy carry-on, correct? Yep. Right, we've lined up a guy who apparently has the inside scoop on Area 51. John Lear is a decorated pilot who spent years flying covert missions for the CIA. Lear claims his work within the US intelligence community has given him the inside knowledge on Area 51. It was rumored to be kind of alien beings taken to Area 51. Is that true? There was two live ones and three deceased aliens in the two crashes that happened. Uh, one is um, uh, friendly and the other is not so friendly. Yes. Yeah. Hold tight. I didn't know this was his angle. Now they have this uh, big half sphere where he lives inside, and when the, um, the president, the vice president, head of the CIA, want to see him, there's a big balcony, and this is all on the, um, on the internet. There's very good drawings of all this stuff, and they bring him up in this half sphere. Okay. And what kind of alien was it? They called that the J-Rod. It definitely wasn't a gray, but the government calls it a J-Rod. Why, why doesn't the, the J-Rod's people either rescue him or, or at least just go, hang on, we'll just go over the head of them and reveal ourselves 
like by literally flying over downtown Manhattan. The aliens are not allowed to give us an overt uh, message. Who doesn't know them? The guys that, uh, that made us. Those guys have been around here for billions yeah. of years. This stuff is so off the hook. My trippers aren't really believing this, are they? The Earth is uh, 11 billion years old. The, the Moon is 20 billion years old and was fabricated inside the planet Jupiter. I'm not buying any of this, but John insists he has photographic evidence. This is a picture of the Moon. I can tell you that this is 125 miles uh, northwest of um, Copernicus, mm -hmm. but this is a city, and you can see the houses, the buildings. Here's an airplane. Here's the uh, different houses, trees, bushes. All down here is just all kinds of um, factories. Factories up here. There's 1.5 to 2 billion people living up there. Really? Yep. I was expecting this former CIA man to be super straight-laced. But his stuff seems to be the most outlandish yet. And it seems to have put off Ben a little. I kind and of believe all of his theories on the bases, uh, Area 51 and such, it sounds very right. plausible, but some of the things where he said were quite out there, right? Like, uh, the moon was made inside Jupiter. Eddie, there's no I, science. There's no science to back that up at all. Eddie, you go down this rabbit hole yeah, of, of yeah. crazy UFO theories. It yeah. just, it does, it only gets yeah. worse. No, I mean, it gets, you're right. It gets, you're right. It has, it has shocked me. Yeah. Twenty-five billion yeah. people on yeah. the moon. Yeah, I know. Benny, and, this and was, yeah, is, but Benny, right. this is, that is, this is your future, dude. That's, well, hopefully you won't. Hopefully, I see what you're saying, right? That's but, that's Christmas future, man. Yeah. After our out-of-this-world encounter with John Lear, I decide the only solution to the problem is to turn the bus around and head straight for Area 51. So we're back on the extraterrestrial highway with only Elvis to guide us. Late that afternoon, we locate an unmarked track leading to the infamous secret base, but things are about to go very wrong. These few secretly taken photographs are our only record of our visit. We arrived at Area 51 checkpoint. To me, it seemed like an ordinary military facility. but my companions were convinced this was the gateway to the extraterrestrial secrets. We got a little bit overexcited and we strayed into the restricted zone to ask where the aliens were being kept. But after knocking on the guardhouse door, we found ourselves lying on the ground with gun barrels pointed at our heads. The military police had detained us for trespassing and confiscated our cameras. Four hours later, we were back on the bus after being released without charge, but with just a camera phone to capture our relief. You must shuffle towards the enemy. Ladies and gentlemen, can we please raise the toasts to our freedom? Yeah! Yay! We are! The only group of people who can say when somebody asks us, Have you ever heard of <laughs> yeah. Area 51, man? Yeah. We can say, Part of it! We've done it! Yeah. 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 There's the signs warning us not to cross the barrier. After last night's hijinks and shenanigans, it's time for a debrief. So how does it make you feel now that you've actually been to Area 51? Do you feel like there's more or less likelihood of any UFO business, alien business? I still believe that they've got some sort of life form and extraterrestrial craft. Why can't, why can't you conceive of the idea that 
Just hu human scientists could have come oh, up with a so stealth bomber. Quickly, not so quickly. We've evolved so quickly within technology. Yeah, but have you ever heard of Moore's law? Computing know, power doubles every two years. Yeah. You don't. You don't need an alien craft. You just. The more humans talk, the faster technology develops. So do you? Do you all still believe? I think. I think they have got a uh, non-terrestrial life form and craft in it. Yeah, it's the same for me. This doesn't change anything. It was a great experience, but uh, like I said, I think it would have happened to any military kind of base. But uh, yeah, so I, basically, I still believe. Yeah. Our arrest has achieved nothing but fan more flames of suspicion. We've been denied access to Area 51, but Darren still thinks he has a chance to prove to me that aliens are real. We're heading back to the perimeter of the base. We are going to go down to a special place in Area 51 history called the Black Mailbox. We're looking for the only landmark in this barren stretch of desert highway, the Black Mailbox. It turns out the Black Mailbox is actually white. The, the famous Black Mailbox of ufology fame. Black or white, if I'm ever going to see an alien, this is probably where it's going to be. This spot, it has the best views over to the mountain range. Behind that mountain range is Area 51. It's, okay. it, it's got the best light, it's open. People, people say it's the best place because you can see things coming up from the base if they come up. What do you mean by things? You mean spaceships? Maybe UFOs. Anything could come up from there. It's Area 51, so, yeah. Sweet as a nut. Let's but get, it, but let, this is it. Let's get started then. Come on. Yay! Right, let's start looking. Hey, aliens. Send me your most funny alien. Right. Yeah, I'll I'll yeah he's right, he's right. Wow, Darren's actually spotted something over Area 51. Oh, there you go. It's like that. Look, 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 look at that shit. Fuck you! Turn around! Fuck you! Turn around! Everybody, everybody in the second didn't exist. There they fucking are. They're military flares, sorry. No, they're not. They're not flares. Unfortunately, not all you see is to be believed. No, that's the flares. Why is the army sending up flares? What they do with flares, we're over the Nellis Air Force bombing range and Area 51, and the flares are used as um, waypoints for aircraft. But there's no aircraft, so why are they firing flares? Exactly. Why are they firing flares? What the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? There you go. That's sonic boom, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I missed it. Sonic boom. <laughs> Where's the sonic boom? It's easy to see how these flares and secret airplanes could be misconstrued. Saw a UFO in the sky last night. Made me wonder. If it's been a long night, and despite all the evidence to the contrary, most of my trippers still think that Area 51 is a hotbed of alien activity. Bing bong! Welcome to Las Vegas. Yay! I'm going to have one last ditch attempt at trying to discredit the Area 51 myth. Today we are going to meet a lady by the name of Annie Jacobson. She is a writer, historian, and expert on Area 51. Viva Las Vegas! Viva Las Vegas! I'm hoping Annie can help me persuade my fellow travelling companions of the simple truth about Area 51. Many people believe it is an underworld of captured aliens and UFOs, as you say. In my experience, interviewing 74 men who worked and lived on the base, I didn't come across a single source that told me about an extraterrestrial. You don't believe that any kind of craft or aliens went there at all, in, in your yes. opinion? Well, what I do believe is that the CIA uses any and all means to keep their secret programs secret. And often what that involves is 
information and disinformation. So if they're trying to keep a program secret and people are busy talking about UFOs, it's a convenient way to not have people ask what's going on with that top secret spy plane. Like from my point of view, as an investigative researcher into, the, into this phenomenon, I have to consider that there is some sort of captured non-terrestrial craft. Does it, does you, you have to. You know, all these crashes, they all happened at the height of the Cold War. The Soviet Union and America were in an arms race to, to build the most sophisticated aircraft. It would have been so much handier for them to go, yeah, 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 yeah it's an alien. I've come across a lot of information that the idea of aliens having come to Earth is a convenient disinformation tool for the CIA. So there is a government cover-up surrounding Area 51, but it concerns US foreign policy and the design of high-tech weapons. It's got nothing to do with flying saucers. And he even introduces us to Richard Mingus, a retired Area 51 employee. He worked at the base for 36 years and was responsible for guarding the U-2 spy plane project. You obviously observe lots of different types of military aircraft. If something flown in the, had flown in the skies that was slightly a little bit more different and you felt that it was different, wouldn't you sort of be able to differentiate between the two, whether it be our craft here, government craft, or something else? You're asking me, did I see really anything different than like the U-2? Yeah. Sure. Um, no. Okay. The, the most extraordinary thing that people say about Area 51 is that there is captured aliens there. I did not see aliens or did I see any spaceships. I seen no conspiracies of any kind taking place out there. <laughs> well, that's a pretty definitive statement to me. What did the gang think? I'm 99.9% .9 sure that they've got an ET craft and all beings on this planet, possibly Area 51. They could be in other places. And that, that's my personal, personal yeah, opinion from experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Everything what you've just said there, that's my view as well. Yeah. I couldn't put it better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Your yeah. margin of doubt is only 1,000. From my own research, yeah. yeah. It's the conclusion we've come to, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'll stand by that. Blimey O'Reilly, right. Well, I haven't got a hope in hell of changing their minds. And Annie's got an extra twist to her story too. Proving whether you believe in aliens or not, Area 51 seems to have the power to inspire tall tales. According to my source, there was a saucer-shaped craft that was sent by Stalin and crashed in the New Mexico desert. And the crash was subsequently moved to Area 51 in 1951, according to my source. And the reason he has this information, and I believe him, is because in that part of the program, he was a first-hand witness. Like, how did it get there? Was it literally rocket propelled? Because what we are led to believe that the craft was actually anti-gravity. The craft was actually piggybacked onto another larger craft, and that is my understanding of how that saucer yeah, that's, got that's here. Cool. Yes. That's cool. Just when I think things can't get any weirder, they do. This craft was sent over, and out came these uh, non-consenting airmen, let's say, that had been surgically altered to look like Martians. Wow. And that is the great horror behind that story. And that physical evidence, according to my source, was moved to Area 51 and has been there for decades. Was there any follow-up to what happened to these deformed Russians? Well, that's where the story becomes very, very secretive, and that's where the source uh, would not share any more information with us. I feel like I'm chasing my tail here. If it's not aliens, it's the Cold War. And it seems to be even getting too much for Scott. I came on here for answers and I'm just really disillusioned now about, there's just so many different fantastic theories out there and it's just, where do they all come from? There's, there's just no answers anywhere, so. I'm just kind of giving up with the subject at the moment. It seems not even Scott's tinfoil hat can protect him from this mental overload. We're coming to the end of our trip, and we're all exhausted. 
I don't know how much appetite for UFOs I still have. But there's still one last angle to Bridget's story I need to explore. Moments after witnessing a 45-foot flying saucer over an LA freeway, Bridget claimed she had an even closer encounter. All of a sudden, it felt like I was being sucked through the steering wheel, out through the dashboard, through the car engine. I then recall being in a field, beings being there. Now, they weren't the typical grey type of beings. They were kind of see-through, flesh-coloured, with veins, quite muscular, with hair. The hair was white, and one of them had a child and tried to present me with this child. If, if, if I was heavily religious and I had Jesus in front of me, I would explain it as that. So she's not only seen aliens, she's been abducted by them. As a final proof of all her claims, she's agreed to take a lie detector test. If she's telling Porky Pies, her heart rate, blood pressure, and respiration will give the game away. You can pass a polygraph test if you listen carefully to every word of the question. Please put it visually to me. Everything's in place, and Bridget is ready to take the lie detector test. But I am having second thoughts now. Here's the... What do you think, Bridget? Do you want to do it? You do. Are you sure? I think doing this and it, her failing it could probably hurt her more than all the aliens she's ever met. She's, she's just a, a nice lady who has had a lot of really odd things happen to her, you know, that for me seemed tall in a tail division, but, you know, I don't need to, we don't need to do this. That's just... Sorry to disturb, and I don't usually pull rank on this one, Bridget. But sorry, sorry to interrupt, Ron. Um, but I don't want to do this, and I don't want you to do it. It's I don't think it's necessary, and I'd rather you did it, Bridget. I kind of don't need to know. I like you. I'd rather you tell me your stories and just leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, you. Come on. Come on. Come on, there's no need. Come on. I was nice. willing to do this. I know you were dirty, but I don't I don't need to know. Okay. All right? Yeah. Okay. I can't help feeling Bridget's whole identity is closely connected to her faith in extraterrestrial beings. And I'm not here to put her through a test that's going to destroy her entire belief system <laughs> and leave her all Christmas and no Santa. Come on. Come on. All right. <laughs> We're done. And at the end of it all, I still don't believe in alien conspiracies. Many people have a need to explain to themselves how the world works. And for my trippers, extraterrestrial life provides some reassuring answers. So what are they taking back from the road trip? I came here thinking that I might get some sort of fact or answer and I haven't got anything which just makes me think that there isn't an answer. I don't want to sit around anymore thinking what's true and what's not. You know, I'd rather just forget about it, um, you know, and focus on, on other things. Well, that's a turn up for the books. I do hope Scott will be able to take his mind off the alien invasion from now on and get on with his life in Swindon. But what about Frankie? UFOs exist. Uh, that is a fact. What they are, whether they're extraterrestrial, interdimensional, government cover-up, um, or at the other end of the spectrum, natural phenomena that people don't re recognize. To me, that issue is separate from the whole alien abduction experience the issue as well. At one point, I thought Ben was going to have a shift of perspective. But he seems as certain as ever of extraterrestrial life. The whole kind of UFO issue 
I think it just stems from like my personal belief and like my actual sight in itself. It's like forever burned in my, my like my mind, you know. So I've I've still got my beliefs that the the are UFOs in the sky, um, and that we have been visited by extraterrestrials. I've got nowhere at all with Darren who is still 99.9% .9 convinced aliens and government agencies are up to all sorts of galactic shenanigans. It's all about awareness. It's all about telling people what you, what you find out and what you know. But the UFO subject is a big conspiracy. The truth is out there. We just need to find it. As for Bridget. Have you changed your opinion on anything? Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> oh, well. I've decided to take her just the way she is. You have my undivided attention, Bridget. I'm now gonna put on my specs, kick back. I want your most high strange story. Okay. Well, I have to give you my recent high strangeness story. All right. If you start snoring, I'm gonna fucking whack you, mate. <laughs> I won't, I promise, I promise, I promise. Go for it. Okay, I'm going to the store. Okay. To go get some groceries. Where was I... it, where was this? Have you been keeping up with our new series of Be Your Own Boss here on 3? Have you been thinking up your own brilliant business ideas and innovative inventions to wow Richard Reed with? Then make sure you tune in for the next episode on Wednesday at 7. Up next, it's Russell Howard's Good News.